title, the inheritance. <coughs> now, I've been led to do this a little differently than we originally did it. Uh, in order to understand the inheritance from a New Testament perspective, we have to understand the inheritance in the Old Testament. There are two inheritances. Scripture teaches <clears throat> the establishment of two inheritance covenants. One is in the Old Testament and one is in the New Testament. And unfortunately, because of the gross ignorance, <clears throat> Christians today mix the two. So, I have been led to give us a comprehension of the difference between the two so that we'll have a clear comprehension of where we stand in the promises of our covenant. <clears throat> the Old Testament begins in uh, Genesis, the 12th chapter, verses 1 to 3, the uh, Old Testament covenant. And the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I'll make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So this is the beginning of the establishment of the covenant, <coughs> the old covenant covenant. Turn to Genesis 15, verses 5 to 7. And he, God, brought him forth, brought him abroad, and said, Look now toward heaven, and tell the stars, if thou be able to, number them. He said unto him, So shalt thy seed be. <clears throat> and he believed in the Lord, and he counted him to him for righteousness. He said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees, to give thee this land to inherit it. This is the culmination of the old covenant promise blessings and the inheritance in the land. <clears throat> now turn to Genesis 17. We're going to read verses 1 to 8. When Abram was ninety years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God, walk before me and do thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee, and I will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell in his face, and God talked to him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant <coughs> is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shalt thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, thy seed, <coughs> after thee, in their generations, for an everlasting covenant, to be a God unto thee, and thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee, to thy seed after thee, the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Now, what's being said here is Abram is brought to understand that the covenant is eternal, <clears throat> and that the promises of the covenant, the inheritance, would not take place in their lifetime mentions thy seed after thee for a perpetual covenant. So, there's a covenant 
that extends to the physical earth, duration of the physical earth, and then it transcends into eternity. Abraham understood this. Most of his descendants did to this day. <coughs> because they can't fathom, they can't comprehend the end of the physical reality, the end of all things physical, the beginning of all things eternal. Anyway, Scripture teaches the patriarchs knew the inheritance promises would not take place in their lifetime. From the Hebrews, the 11th chapter, verses 13 to 16. Where's this one? Hebrews 11, verses 13 to 16. Hebrews 11, 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Those in the know understood that the promises wouldn't come to them in this lifetime because the promises were eternal. In order to inherit the promises, they had to be eternal. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. So when you look at the scripture, it says that they declared there were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. They understood that their natural state would not be temporal, human. It would be immortal, eternal. So they understood that different conditions would have to come into being before they could in inherit the promises. And not only if they had, verse 15, and not only if they had been mindful of that country from which they came out, they might have that opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is, in heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. So they understood. The Lord talked to Abram. Why is V.H. talked to Abram intimately, which is not recorded, but it's clearly intimated. When the scripture we read in uh, Genesis, the 12th chapter, it says, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get you out of your father's house to a land I'll show you. It's talking about the end of a conversation that he had with Abram, detailing the things that he had planned for Abram. So things weren't done in a corner. Uh, Abram had established a relationship with YHVH, and this relationship was based on revelation knowledge that he had received. And this is what he based his faith on. <clears throat> he understood as the promises progressed, they could not be contained in temporality. That they were eternal. Therefore, coming to the understanding of the eternality of the promises, he understood that he could not receive them in the state that he was in, being immortal that he would be changed and of course he understood the, the, the concept of resurrection and that that would be the time in which he would enter into receiving the promises <coughs> thirdly he understood the promises dealt with the earth a temporal earth an eternal earth teaches that Abraham knew his descendants would be the kings of the earth in the coming age, ruling the nations of earth from Jerusalem. So the whole totality of all the promises in the Old Testament and under the Old Covenant dealt with first the temporal earth, then an eternal earth. Nothing beyond that. And that's as far as they looked. That was as much as they expected. <clears throat> Abraham knew that his descendants would be the kings of the eternal earth. Turn to Ezekiel, 37th chapter, verses 
here what we have is the prophecy dealing with the setting up of the, of the kingdom, that is, the beginning of the millennial age, on into the eternal state. Starting at verse 24. And David, my servant, <clears throat> shall be king over them. And they all shall have one shepherd. They shall walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. And they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob, my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt. And they shall dwell therein, even they and their children and their children's children forever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Yea, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And the heathen shall know that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel, when my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forevermore. Now, what we find here is the Lord is talking about establishing a new covenant up until the time of the return of Christ to earth, they will have been under this covenant. It's called the Abrahamic covenant. <clears throat> because they rejected the new covenant that we're under. So he's going to establish that new covenant with them when he returns. He talks about them dwelling in the land, their children, their children's children. He's talking about generation that will live in the land in contemporary time. In other words, together. Fathers, grandfathers, grandsons, great-grandsons on. In the eternal <clears throat> state, all the generations that are saved will dwell eternally together. Notice what he goes on to say. This takes place, verse 27, My tabernacle also shall be with them, Yea, I will be their God, they shall be my people. I'm going to repeat that. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Yea, I will be their God, they shall be my people. And the heathen shall know that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel. But my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forevermore. In other words, that's when they set up the eternal kingdom over the earth. They will rule and reign. The kings of earth will be the Israelite kings ruling over the non-Israelite nations forever. Now, turn to Revelation, 21st chapter, verse, starting in verse 1. Down, we're going to read verse 1 down to verse 5. All right, so a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. There was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of of God is with men. This is a fulfillment of Ezekiel 37. The tabernacle of God is with men, and he shall dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, the former things are passed away. He that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. He said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. That's the fulfillment of the <coughs> old covenant promise. That's why you have a new earth. Being, God wanted to bless Abraham his seed. Now under that particular time, man was not qualified 
for heaven. So any way he could be blessed eternally was to extend earth to make it eternal. And that is the situation regarding the old covenant promises. Every promise that was given to them deals with the earth and the things of earth. From a temporal to an eternal state. The law, which was given by Moses, was just a continuation of the promises from a temporal perspective. <clears throat> it didn't establish anything new. It would just would continued to give <clears throat> the um, needs of the people at that time. <clears throat> and of course it was contingent upon them obeying the, the principles, the rules, the, the statutes that YHVH had given to them. If they obeyed them, then their blessings would continue. If they disobeyed them, then curses would come upon them. So what we find here, this is the essence of quintessence of <coughs> the Old Covenant. Uh, Revelation 21, verses 24 to 27. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. The kings of the earth, which are the Israelite kings, do bring their glory and honor into it. The gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. They shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it, and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination, or maketh a lie, for they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Now we notice something. <clears throat> notice what it says. The nations of them which are saved. So <clears throat> Israel is going to live in the land. The new Jerusalem will be the center of the land. Only immortals glorified will be able to inhabit the city itself. The Israelites will inhabit the regions around Jerusalem, the, the eternal uh, sectors that were assigned to them on the temple earth will be translated into the eternal state. Beyond Israel, the Gentile nations of those that are saved from Adam to the end of the first resurrection will live on the new earth. This includes New Testament saints that didn't qualify for heaven. We'll take up residence on the new earth under the authority of the Israelite kings. It says that the kings can enter into the holy city because they have a state of glory. And they bring the honor and the glory of the nations that they govern in with them, but the people can't come in. They don't have the... They're not in the glory state to be able to do that. So they're outside the city <coughs> outside Israel on the lands that have been allocated to them and that will be the situation forever now you get a picture of what it will be like turn over to Isaiah the 66th chapter Isaiah 22 to 24. <clears throat> For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain, Israel. <clears throat> so come to pass that from one new moon to another, from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me, for their worms shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched. They shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. This is going to be the final state <clears throat> on the earth. You're going to have a, a, a hierarchical order 
in which the Sabbaths that were initially established, which were just a type of what would eventually be, will be permanently established. All the Gentile nations will come to Jerusalem to worship on the particular Sabbath time. They will worship the Lord uh, in a region reserved for them. <clears throat> the temple is divided into three sections for the Gentiles, for the priests, and for the, the inner sanctuary. They will come to the court of the Gentiles, worship the Lord. <clears throat> That's why there's only one street in the city. Because the, the immortals don't need streets. They're for the Gentiles to come in to worship and to uh, pay their obedience to God for ministry and for <clears throat> healing. It talks about the tree of life will yield its leaves once a month. And the leaves are for the healing of the nations. So they'll come up that street and be able to partake of the healing of the tree of life. <clears throat> and then they will leave. Mm -hmm. There's a section that's going to be rem remain open where they'll be able to look out into the torment regions of eternity, the lake of fire, out of darkness, and they'll be able to look down and they'll be able to see every soul that transgressed. And the, the Father does that so as to be a sign to them of what rebellion brings to an individual. Now, from the heavens, you won't have that. This is merely for those on the earth, uh, particularly for the humans. They're just made it by the skin of their teeth. The majority of them uh, are born, will be born in the millennial period, and they'll be tested at the end of the millennial period to see if they join the satanic rebellion or if they remain loyal to God. The ones that remain loyal to God will be brought onto the <coughs> new earth, along with those who have died and only died in faith. They have no rewards in heaven, therefore they forfeit their place in heaven. But because they're saved, they're going to be preserved. All that will be the arrangement. Uh, <clears throat> so basically they're all going to be in a, a sort of a old covenant relationship. And this is what the greats look for. They were looking for the resurrection where they would stand before the Lord. They were looking for the, the, the giving of the promises of the covenant. The positions that they would have. The relationship that would be established as the people of God. The setting up of the rule over the Gentile nation. This is basically the promises that the patriarchs would look for. Now, our covenant is radically different. Turn to Hebrews 11, chapter, verse 39 to 40. Was 11, 39 to 40. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. It's repeated several times. They didn't get it because the promises are eternal. Verse 40. God provided some better thing for us. The day without us should not be made perfect. In other words, he's talking to the new covenant partakers. This is the ending of the Old Covenant discussion entering into the New Covenant. He's saying God, two things here. He's saying God provided a better, much better covenant for us and that they do not receive their promises ahead of us. We receive the fullness of what God has for us before they receive their promises, whether temporal or eternal. Mm. It's just an indicator of how superior the new covenant is to the old covenant. Now, I want to take a look at some things dealing with this. 
This is going to be a, at least a two-part lesson because there's so much is there you cannot cover it in one thing. Principle Scripture teaches everyone under the new covenant, everyone under the new covenant has a higher position than the highest under the old covenant. Turn to Matthew, 11th chapter, verse 7 to 11. <coughs> Matthew 11, verses 7 to to 11. <clears throat> and as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, John the Baptist, What went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind? But what went ye out for to see? A man clothed with soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. So, basically, he's talking about John, John's appearance. John looks like a hippie. <laughs> and he's got all this... Uh, girdle with uh, a hair, a hairy garment. Uh, he's, <clears throat> when he speaks, he speaks loudly. <clears throat> he need a microphone. Mm. That's why Jesus is saying, what went for you out to see a reed shaking with the wind? Some weak need an uh, 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 individual talking uh, smooth, uh, uh, um, uh, soft words? No. He said, um, John the Baptist isn't like that. As far as his appearance is concerned, if you want to see somebody well-dressed, you go to a king's court. So he's describing John to the people, and he's giving John commendation. He says, verse 9, But what went ye out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet. For well, this is he, of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. So what he's saying here, this isn't just a, a prophet. This is a special prophet who's named, his ministry is named in the scripture. He's the transition prophet. This is he, the great one, who would come before me, preparing the way for me. Verse 11, Verily I say unto you, Among them that are born of women, there has not risen a greater than John the Baptist. It's the highest acc accolade you can give a human being. He's saying above everybody born in the human race, there hasn't risen a greater than that man, John the Baptist. But he goes on to say, Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Why is he saying that? He's giving us a comparison between the old covenant and the new covenant. The old covenant is called the law. The new covenant is called the kingdom. John is a transition figure. He is the go-between, the link between the old covenant and the new covenant. He's the last of the old covenant, Old Testament prophets. This is what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, I've come to fulfill the Old Covenant and establish the New Covenant. And what he's also going on to say is everybody that's in the New Covenant, the least in the New Covenant, is greater than the greatest of the Old Covenant. <clears throat> so he's talking about, this is true for temporalities, it's true for eternity. Those in the kingdom of heaven will be greater than the Israelite kings of earth that have qualified for what God has for them in eternity, eternal state. Scripture teaches those of the old covenant were not eligible for the promises of the new covenant. Couldn't qualify. It's under the Gospel of John, third chapter, verse 25 to 31. <clears throat> the 
Gospel of John, third chapter, verse 25, 31. Then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. So he's talking about Jesus. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except to be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy therefore is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly, and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. So what he's saying here, John understood that the old covenant was an earth-centered covenant. He understood that Jesus was establishing a far superior covenant. He understood more than a lot of new covenant Christians understand the difference, the differentiation. And he, you could tell he longed to enter into the new covenant, but he couldn't. <coughs> because his ministry was that he would have to be part of the old covenant. <coughs> so what's being said here, <coughs> you notice he talks about the bride. He understood the difference between the groups. His disciples... The disciples of the scribes and the Pharisees were all under the Old Covenant. Those that were with Jesus constituted the bride. <clears throat> Jesus called them the children of the bride chamber. So you had a distinction between these three groups. The bride is under the New Covenant and all the promises of the New Covenant pertain to them. All under the Old Covenant cannot enter into the promises of the New Covenant. They can't qualify. Now, what we find, the Scripture teaches the promises of the New Covenant inheritance have been kept hidden from those of the Old Covenant. Because they wouldn't qualify, God understood they wouldn't understand. So, the promises, the characteristic of the New Covenant, everything was kept, and even from the righteous. Turn to Matthew, 13th chapter, verses 10 to 17. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? Talking to the masses. He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but unto them it is not given. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away even that he hath. Therefore I speak I to them in parables. Because they, seeing, see not, and hearing, they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear and not understand, and seeing ye shall see and not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, their eyes are dull of hearing, their eyes they have closed. Lest at any time they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. So their mindset was such <clears throat> they refused to prepare themselves. John the Baptist's ministry was to prepare them for the coming of the Lord. And it, for the most part, it fell on deaf ears. Well, for one thing, the scribes and the Pharisees tried to neutralize what he was doing. For another thing, because of human nature, because of the enemy, they were content not to prepare themselves 
for entrance into the new covenant, but they were content where they were, so they shut themselves out. Now, what we find, <coughs> turn to Daniel, 12th chapter, verse 7 to 9. Daniel 12, verse 7 to 9. Just like Christians today shut themselves out of the glories that they could have, so did the ancient Israelites. Daniel 12, verse 7 to 9. And I heard the man clothed in linen, which is upon the water of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever, that it shall be for a time and times and a half, when he shall have accomplished the scandal of the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. I heard it, but I didn't. Un but I understood not. Then said I, O oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly. And none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. He's talking about those of the new covenant. <clears throat> the righteous, the prophets of the old covenant, didn't understand the things that would pertain to the new covenant. That's why you have apostles and prophets and teachers in the new covenant. They had to receive revelation knowledge and give it to God's people. 1 Corinthians, 2nd chapter, verses 9 to 12. 1 Corinthians, 2nd chapter, verses 9 to 12. But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. For God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Paul was a revelator of hidden revelation knowledge. Knowledge that had been hidden from the beginning of the creation to the time in which the new covenant would be established and those that entered into it would be inheritors of it. Nobody else. This is what he's referring to. Now the revelation is given to us. Verse 11. For what man knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of man which is in him even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Let's stop there. The Holy Spirit was with them, dwelt with them, never in them. The Holy Spirit is with us and He dwells in us. He dwells in us for two reasons. Number one, to give us supernatural ability to live the life that Jesus has declared us to live. Number two, to give us revelation knowledge, the knowledge that has been hidden about our inheritance. It can only be understood from the spiritual perspective. Without it, you can't enter into it. With it, all things are yours. <coughs> 